All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our um, spotlight session number six. Uh, just um, kind of has been a long day, so glad that you're still around. And I think we have a couple of great uh, paper presentations and discussion that will will follow. Um, as Anna just mentioned, we're going to be recording this um, talk, so um, please be aware of that. Now we're going to spend 30 minutes on the presentation and then 15 minutes for the discussion. Uh, hopefully there's going to be time in between and during so for people to ask questions, but the idea is that after the session, if there's still remaining questions, we can all gather back into the virtual venue and we can continue this discussion. There's some special areas in the virtual venue in the room carpets are tall where you can actually will see the title of the paper and then you can go there and the speaker might uh, will join you uh, and then we can follow up some some discussion if there's any questions left so um, with that uh, i'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker Ravif kumar he's going to be talking about sun uh, machine learning framework uh, for robust pricing so um Ravi, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, I first want to thank the organizers for uh, uh, inviting us to the session, and thank you, everyone, for attending the session. Uh, so, so my name is Ravi Kumar. I'm a lead scientist at Prose, uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, price sensitivity estimation, particularly uh, in the context of uh, the problem of airline pricing. Uh, this is joint work with my co-authors, Shaheen Buloki, Carl Eastler, Yunus Roch, and then Darius Walchek. So let me start by uh, motivating the problem. So consider uh, the problem of pricing. Uh, a firm wants to price a product. This product has some associated cost C, uh, and they want to refine the pricing in the presence of uh, a shopping context uh, defined by a vector X. And this shopping context could, could comprise of uh, product features, uh, various market situations, and other things that they want to include in refining the price. And they are interested in, in, in constructing some pricing algorithms, which uh, uh, determines the optimal price to maximize expected revenue or expected margin contribution from just the sales opportunity. So it's not a long horizon problem. We know the, We already know the costs. And given these costs, we want to refine the prices. Uh, in particular airline settings, such problems are uh, prevalent. Uh, so in this particular case, the shopping context could be uh, basically trip related uh, features. So for example, origin destination, compartment, time of day, point of sale, whether it's a direct or connecting flight and so on. And given these shopping contexts, you may be interested in uh, figuring out the price for an itinerary. Uh, the, the relevant cost in this particular case, for example, is uh, bid price at the current inventory system. So we are assuming that uh, the, the airline already has uh, solved an optimization problem to, to construct its opportunity costs. Uh, these are available. And when the shopping context comes, uh, they, they use these bid prices or opportunity costs to further refine prices. Or they might be interested in bundle pricing, which is the sum of... Uh, the bid prices for the seats and the ancillary costs. Uh, now in uh, the current uh, RM and pricing systems employed by the airlines, in many cases, uh, this refinement, given the bid prices or opportunity costs are computed using some kind of uh, rules, which may not be uh, based on estimation of price sensitivity or, or uh, things of that nature. Uh, so that's the problem, and uh, we, we are assuming that uh, the firm only has access to his, uh, historical data in terms of purchases with prices and context features. Uh, this, this is to distinguish from the fact that uh, they cannot observe uh, responses to individual requests. So whether a particular request uh, resulted in a, in, in a no purchase is not observable. So they don't have loss information. This setting is quite common in uh, industries like airline, car rental, and hotels, where a large fraction of sales occur through third-party channels like online travel agents. Uh, in this particular setting, one of the ways uh, the, the, the firm can still implement dynamic pricing is by estimating price sensitivity uh, through demand response modeling. So essentially, here we are trying to measure the sensitivity of purchases to changes in prices. In such a model, you would model, uh, let's say, purchasing purchases given a context feature X and price P uh, through some uh, specification of a random com component, for example, it's Poisson distributed. 
with mean rate and uh, this mean rate is uh, exponential and sum of two two things one is uh, modeling the effect of how IQ and a second part which impacts how the uh, what is the total volume right so uh, this this component phi uh, controls the total volume in a given period in a sense that if uh, we price at zero, then uh, then the demand has a mean of exponential of phi of x. So if we are able to estimate a demand response model, parameters of this demand response model, uh, then the optimal price, uh, let's say if you are given co cost and some feature vector x uh, determined by maximizing margin contribution uh, would be a closed form, at least in this particular case with Poisson exponential form. Uh, where the optimal price is just cost plus uh, a, a, a factor which only uh, depends on parameters which control price sensitivity. It doesn't uh, depend on the volume parameters because there is no interaction of the volume parameter with, with price. So in, in this sense, if there is an oracle which just gives us estimates of these price sensitivity parameters, that's enough for solving the pricing problem. But because we are trying to do this by demand response modeling, uh, this volume part is not observable. Ne it needs to be simultaneously estimated with the price sensitivity parameter. Uh, this is not useful for us, this phi of x component. So in econometrics literature, these parameters which need to be estimated but are not useful are often uh, referred to as nuisance parameters. So that's the core problem that we have. We want to estimate these price sensitivity parameters of our demand response uh, using historical sales transactions. Uh, in terms of literature, which is associated with this problem, uh, of course, there's a lot of work uh, in, in dynamic pricing in the pre presence of contextual features uh, coming from operations research community. A uh, lot of this, and recently, a lot of this work has focused on practical algorithms, on algorithms which, uh, which learn, uh, so online, based on banded principles and so on. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, less focus on uh, sort of the inference perspective, right? So uh, the, the fact that this is this is basically uh, a treatment effect estimation problem. So that that focus is, is a little bit lacking. And the other thing is uh, how to use modern ML techniques. So for, for example, uh, sophisticated ML estimators like deep neural nets or gradient boosted machines, how to leverage this in, in this problem. Another stream of work, which is also very relevant, is coming from econometrics or causal inference community, uh, and that is related to estimation of treatment effects. Uh, of course, th th there have been two-stage models related to instrumental variable approaches. Uh, however, traditionally, econometrics has focused much more on policy insights. So what's the impact of uh, schooling on uh, income, right? So a, a policy kind of kind of decisions, but uh, not as much on practical algorithm side. Uh, moreover, uh, most of this work has focused on uh, treatment variables which are binary in nature, or if they are, uh, they have focused on continuous treatment variables, like in this particular case, we have price, which is on a continuum. Uh, the focus has been on linear or log linear models with additive noise structures. So uh, in this particular work, we, we want to construct uh, practical algorithms for real-time dynamic pricing uh, problem, but we also want to leverage some of the insights from the inference community uh, so that the estimators are robust, right? And, and for, with a specific use case for airline pricing. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the key solution features that we are looking for is that we want a model which is interpretable, at least in terms of the price sensitivity effects. Yet, if uh, it, it warrants the use of more sophisticated ML techniques, then we should be able to use it. And we uh, manage that uh, via semi-parametric modeling. The second aspect, uh, as I just mentioned, is robustness. Uh, and uh, we will we'll discuss robustness in what sense, but uh, in, in, in constructing these robust estimators, we leveraged uh, recent advances in econometrics and causal inference community. And of course, because this is for practical application, we want algorithms which are fast, scalable, could be estimated in an online way. And for that, we leverage Bayesian dynamic generalized models. 
So uh, let me start by introducing the demand response model, which is a Poisson semi-parametric model. Uh, so we, we model bookings given context feature X and price P uh, in a particular pre-selected time unit, maybe daily sales and so on, uh, as, as Poisson distributed. Uh, and its mean is exponential. Uh, the effect of price on demand is specified through this linear term. This vector W is a subvector of X. Uh, and then we also have an additional component, phi of x, which I have not specified here. The form is uh, not specified. So this controls the volume or what I just refer to as the nuisance parameter. Now, the, the thing is that although this is a, this parameter phi is not of interest, but it can be quite complicated. So here I'm showing a picture of uh, bookings on a market uh, on a particular leg as a function of departure date. Now, these bookings get affected by all kinds of seasonality, yearly seasonality, day of week seasonality, uh, holiday and special events, booking patterns in terms of how bookings come uh, over the booking horizon, uh, departure time dependencies, and other market features. So although this is, this is not useful for us, but this could be quite complex, this modeling of the overall volume. Uh, so ideally, what we would want is we would like to leverage uh, some sophisticated ML estimator like gradient-boosted machines or deep neural nets to model this part while keeping the specification of price sensitivity effects linear. Right. So, uh, of course, directly uh, we run into an issue because this nuisance part is not directly observable. What I showed here are bookings which are responses of this model, not the volume part. So we cannot observe this. So it's not at the outset clear, how do you train, uh, how do you leverage an ML estimator for modeling this part? But just, just uh, if we are able to do that, then we will have a specification where this uh, component phi of X is non-parametric and the price sensitivity effect is parametric and therefore the name semi-parametric model. Okay, so one of the ways in which you can do that, this estimation directly of, of these parameters theta is by implementing them through an architecture, uh, a deep neural net architecture, where uh, we have uh, our inputs, price and feature vectors. In one part of the neural network, uh, we are taking component by product, sending it through a dense one layer, uh, so this is con uh, constructing this specification of the price sensitivity effects. Uh, the weights of this layer uh, are the price sensitivity parameters. Uh, we are also passing in the other part, the full feature vector through a series of hidden layers. This is the deep part. And then we are constructing uh, and then passing it through a, a dense one layer uh, to construct this volume part. That's phi of x. Uh, these can be added together to construct the log rate. Right, which uh, so this is a specification of our uh, Poisson semi-parametric model. We can train this uh, based on the observed purchases utilizing a negative log like layered loss through packages like TensorFlow probability. So this is one way of estimating this. Th there are other ways also which can be iterative in nature, but they are also computationally uh, more costly. The problem here is if we implement this, this leads to uh, biased estimates of our price sensitivity. Uh, the, the thing is that this, this is an inference problem. We are interested in estimating theta, which are more akin to estimating the derivatives of our demand as a function of uh, the inputs or, or price. And so these methods, which are uh, built to give good prediction of demand, uh, may not give us good prediction of, of the price sensitivity parameter theta especially when we are using observational data, right? So the, the data that we have uh, has come under the pricing policy, which was implemented by the airline, which could be a revenue maximizing policy. This is to differentiate it from data, which is interventional, uh, which could be collected under a carefully constructed experiment or uh, some randomized pricing policy. So we don't have interventional data. We only have observational data. And if you try to use this, this approach, uh, it leads to bias estimate of uh, price sensitivity parameters. So one needs to look at this problem, not from the lens of uh, 
regression or prediction, but from inference. And if we do that, one of the things that uh, is very well known in, in inference community that uh, the bias in these treatment effects could be coming because of uh, what are known as certain covariates called confounding variables. So these confounders in this picture uh, denoted by X in the red circle are variables which uh, causally affect both price and demand. An example of this, for example, is a, is, is, is a conference in a city which is not virtual. So it is going to affect demand on the flights uh, to that city. And if the forecaster or the revenue management system knows about this conference, the pricing managers knows, know about this conference, they are going to impact the price for those, uh, those flights. So, so that's, that's one example. Now, of course, presence of confounders per se is not the problem, but not identifying them and including in the regression model leads to bias estimate of price sensitivity. And in, in our use case, in airline pricing problem, uh, one of the challenges we face is that the pricing policy is a complex interaction between the revenue management system and pricing systems. So let's say if there are certain variables which impact demand, chances are that these a lot of these variables are included in the forecaster and optimizer of the revenue management system. So your opportunity costs are impacted by, by these variables. Then there is a further refinement uh, to pricing applied through fair rules, where some of these variables are again directly considered. For example, advanced purchase restrictions. So all of this leads to uh, prices being impacted by these variables, right? So if we have observational data, Thanks. we have lots of confounding variables in this particular application. So uh, one thing that uh, is different between inference and uh, prediction is that that we need to identify these confounding variables and include uh, include them in the model. So uh, we not only need to work with a main equation, which I showed you earlier, but uh, an auxiliary equation to track what variables impact price. So this is an auxiliary equation. Uh, so price given x could be some complicated function of x plus some zero mean edit of noise. Uh, well. Oh, we, we are in uh, this big data age, so we can collect almost all data. So at least we can get away by collecting all this data and including them in the model from this problem of, uh, of uh, omitted variable bias. But by including so many covariates, this leads to complex and high dimensional models. And when we are dealing, working with uh, these complex and high dimensional models, uh, one thing that we need to implement in ML for controlling the variance of our estimators and prevent overfitting is regularization. So uh, in a simple linear model case where let's say theta is the price sensitivity parameter scalar and uh, this beta, this is a high dimensional nuisance parameter, I might be implementing some uh, ridge or lasso penalty to control for variance of my estimator. Now, as soon as I do that, this leads to a bias in the estimate of our parameter theta, just this regularization. Uh, if you, you, know, you can run experiments where it's with even simple models like this, you can, uh, you know, we did a Monte Carlo uh, simulation where uh, over hundred independent trials through synthetic data, uh, the, the true value of this parameter theta is negative one. Uh, the histogram are basically the estimates of this parameter through in these independent Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and the mean of that is uh, denoted by this uh, dashed red line. Uh, it's negative 0.94, whereas the true value is negative one. So this bias actually doesn't go away. And this is because of uh, particularly regularization. And as you increase this regularization penalty, the bias increases even more. So it's from 6% to 12% here. Uh, and even if you do something sophisticated where, okay, in the first stage, you uh, you you do a regularization and then you take this nuisance parameter and run a second stage model uh, with, with this estimated nuisance parameter to estimate only the price sensitivity uh, because the first stage estimator was biased, your second stage estimator would also be biased, right? So this is the problem that you encounter uh, because of high dimensional model and requiring to uh, this need for regularization. So this is the central question that uh, how can we construct robust estimators for price sensitivity parameters given such uh, regularization related biases? 
so one of the techniques that uh, uh, can be used here is called Neyman orthogonalization. So given our Poisson semi-parametric model, we can uh, write the log likelihood uh, of that given, given data. Uh, now, if I know the true parameter value of my nuisance parameter phi, let's call that phi naught, uh, then uh, I can, so, so if I just fix this value phi naught, this is a Poisson generalized linear model. And so I can find the estimator for my price sensitivity by maximizing the expected log likelihood uh, over, over theta. Now, because this is a Poisson GLM given uh, the, the true value of phi naught, uh, this log likelihood is concave. So uh, if I'm maximizing this, I can write the gradient with respect to theta. So that's the score function. Uh, and this score function at the true parameter values should be zero. Now, uh, neighbor orthogonalization approach basically tries to construct score functions, which are uh, insensitive to, to some minor errors in, in this nuisance parameter phi here. So essentially, they are locally robust around the true value of the nuisance parameter. Uh, so this, this approach was has existed uh, since a long time, but uh, recently it has been popularized by Chernozikov et al. Uh, in, in their work uh, and, and coming mostly from econometrics community. Uh, and, and this condition is essentially uh, writing that condition where, uh, which is saying that this score function remains zero in a local sort of neighborhood of my true nuisance parameter of phi naught. So, so the errors due to bias estimation of phi uh, essentially has no first order effect in, in, in these uh, gradients or score functions. So that's, uh, that's the Neyman orthogonalization intuition. Now, if you apply that to the Poisson semi-parametric model, uh, what you get is that you could, uh, instead of working with your original uh, demand response, you can instead work with a reduced form equation. So, so the uh, orthogonalized score function corresponds to this reduced form equation, where which differs from the main equation in the sense that instead of working with price, you are working with residual of price with respect to expected price. So p hat here is expected price. And instead of the original nuisance function phi of x, you have log of y hat, where y hat is the expected bookings. So in some sense, uh, instead of the original demand curve, you are, you are working with uh, modeling deviation of demand with respect to expected bookings as a function of deviation of price with respect to expected price. Right, and uh, working with these reduced form uh, models is advantageous from many perspectives. So, and particularly from the practical perspective. So, uh, you know, in, in this reduced form model, uh, we still need to estimate certain parameters which are not useful. So these are our new nuisance parameter, but these are uh, P hat, which is the expected price and Y hat, which is the expected bookings. Uh, the advantage now is that both price and bookings are observable quantities. So we can leverage sophisticated ML estimators for constructing, uh, you know, for, for modeling these. Uh, moreover, uh, you know, uh, estimating or predicting expected price is akin to learning the firm's historical policy. So that could be useful from practical perspective in terms of uh, figuring out bounds on your dynamic pricing solution. Uh, and secondly, if we have estimated these uh, P hats and Y hats, the expected price and expected bookings, then our model here becomes a Poisson generalized linear model, uh, the simple parametric Poisson generalized linear model. So we can, uh, you know, estimate theta based on any of the shelf uh, uh, GLM package. Uh, and of course, the main motivation for doing all of this was to uh, make our estimators robust to uh, errors in the nuisance parameters, that of course is, is accomplished. So this leads to the following two-stage approach, where in the first stage, we construct ML estimators for expected bookings given uh, the, the feature vector X and expected price given the feature vector X. And in the second stage, we leverage these first stage estimators uh, in our reduced form model uh, to construct the estimator for the price sensitivity parameter theta. Uh, in, in our case, you could use any, uh, you know, uh, GLM frequentist approach. We decided to use a Bayesian dynamic generalized linear model for estimating the, these parameter theta, 
uh, particularly so that uh, it gives the advantage of having an online update. Uh, secondly, it also provides us uncertainty estimates on this parameter, which can be leveraged, for example, if you want to do some uh, learning policy. And thirdly, you could also uh, uh, you, you could also use uh, domain knowledge in certain cases to construct informative priors and so on. Right. Ravi, you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. So uh, to test these models, we, we tested them on, uh, on a, a simulation test bed. Uh, and the simulation uh, test bed was constructed to mimic this uh, complex interaction between the revenue management and the pricing system. So we, we have some uh, known ground truth uh, volume and price sensitivity parameters. Uh, these are uh, then used uh, in an optimizer to construct, uh, to solve a dynamic program uh, and then uh, construct optimal pricing policies, which interact with the sample arrival streams in a reservation system to construct booking and price history. So we use the simulation test bed to construct approximately two years of, of history uh, and, and then tested uh, all of these models on that. So in this table, uh, in, in blue, I'm denoting, uh, I'm rep representing the true value of the price sensitivity parameters that were used in the simulation. Uh, and in the second column, uh, it is the price sensitivity parameter estimated using the, the direct approach of one stage models using deep neural nets. Uh, we see that most of these parameters are uh, overestimating the true parameters. And if we compute the mean absolute percentage error uh, with respect to the true, it's around 25%. Uh, in the third column, it's the two stage approach where uh, in the first stage, we used a random forest for both price and booking predictions. And in the second stage, we used uh, a, a Bayesian DJLM for estimating theta parameters. And we see that these uh, estimates are much closer to the true. In fact, uh, the mean absolute percentage error has uh, reduced by, uh, you know, to 5%, right? So that's, that's quite uh, an improvement. Uh, be and because we are using a Bayesian uh, DJLM approach, uh, we are doing online updates. So we can even construct basically how these parameters uh, update over time. So here in the on x-axis uh, are individual simulation runs or unique flight departures. And the dotted line is the true parameter. So uh, we started off with very non-informative priors, as you can see here. And within uh, around 40 runs, uh, the model converges very close for most of these point of sale time frame combinations It converges close to the true parameter values. So definitely in, on simulation, we do see a really good performance from these two stage uh, methods. We also did tests uh, using real data, but of course on real data, uh, because we don't know the true price sensitivity estimate, we can only make qualitative comments. So uh, here are some results from two markets. So in these pictures on x-axis are days prior, so days before departure, zero is departure. And uh, the dotted lines are price trajectories. So as we are going close to de departure, the prices are increasing. Uh, the solid lines are uh, price sensitivity estimates or reciprocal of uh, this theta parameter called alpha. Uh, for our one stage, uh, the deep neural net uh, model that I uh, talked about. And these are these solid lines. Uh, now, actually, the pricing policy given alpha is just alpha plus bid price. So in some sense, this alpha is like a lower bound in price. Now, although it is increasing as a function of uh, days prior, uh, which is expected, but it is also severely overestimating the price. So it, it does give an indication that this may not, uh, that there is a higher bias uh, in, in these price sensitivity estimates. Uh, once we implemented a two-stage approach here, we see all of these price sensitivity estimates are lower than price. They still have this increasing trend, which is intuitive. So to some extent, this gives qualitative indication that uh, these two-stage methods lead to less bias estimates of price sensitivity. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude. Uh, essentially, the main um, observations are that uh, estimating price sensitivity is an inference problem. Uh, so one needs to be really careful about uh, biases and estimates of price sensitivity parameters. If we are using one stage regression approaches, these could be due to omitted variable bias, or as I just mentioned, regularization bias. Uh, for solving these problems, just sophisticated ML estimators are not enough. 
But if we could combine them with uh, these uh, causal inference techniques uh, to construct robust estimators, that's a, a really promising way. And uh, we gave an example of such, such a two-stage approach uh, using on a Poisson semi-parametric model and for airline uh, case, and we do see promising results on simulated and real data. And extension to more sophisticated choice models, I think, uh, is also a very promising uh, uh, direction for, for this, this approach. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Ravi. Um, let's see, do we have any questions for Ravi before um, we move into our uh, discussion with Gustavo? Any questions? Okay, um, so maybe Gustavo, you wanna take over and then after Gustavo's discussion, we can maybe go back to if anybody has questions. Sure. Okay. So thank you, thank you, Rene, and thank you, uh, thanks to the organizer in general for for the invitation, and thanks to Ravi and co-author for the opportunity of uh, discussing uh, your uh, your paper. So um, I'm gonna just I have a, just a few slides here uh, highlighting a few of the of the features I I, I really enjoyed while 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 uh, reading the the paper. Um, so it's good to know first that there is a there is a full paper uh, around this uh, this talk, and uh, it's also great to know that this uh, paper was uh, fully authored by practitioners, indeed from one of the big players in the airline revenue management sector. Indeed, from what I learned, getting the draft uh, of the paper, they are targeting a top journal, which is which is great, and also it's great to be part of the I mean for this paper to be part of this uh, spotlight session. In this uh, in this well known uh, conference, so um, so I think that, I mean the paper in general. Actually, I will have a few questions probably along the, along the way of, of my of my of my few slides. Um, so uh, the paper discusses one of the problems that the industry uh, practice has been watching closely for years. Indeed, now with a new twist, the classic problem is uh, the estimation of future dependent demand when no purchases are, are non-observable. Uh, the new twist is uh, combining a non-parametric machine learning based component with a parametric interpretable price sensitivity component. And I really like the, the idea of, to some extent, preserving this interpretability of this uh, price sensitivity parameter uh, to some extent out of the black box that is defining this machine learning approach. Uh, and actually, it's also good to know the, the promising results that the authors are showing both in the paper and, of course, in the, in the presentation. Um, I think one of the, I mean, the, one of the, of, uh, actually, indeed, two of the, of the big opportunities uh, hanging from this paper are the following. First is that uh, it's great for the academic community to learn from first-hand users about a classic problem that continues to be a big challenge. Uh, and indeed, uh, also knowing about the new techniques that they are using in order to try to solve and to approach this problem. Uh, so that's kind of, to some extent, the, the big opportunity for, for the academic community. But at the same time, uh, there is a big opportunity for practitioners, uh, indeed, to borrow ideas and leverage good practices. So I think this is kind of uh, two of the, of the big, I would say, uh, of the big opportunities coming from, from this uh, paper and presentation. So um, just to briefly repeat some of the ideas that Ravi uh, clearly put in his presentation. Um, so the focus of the paper is uh, about uh, the fact that despite the ability to collect data at the granular level from each uh, shopping session, uh, the estimation of price sensitivity from such historical observational data still remains challenging. Some of the reasons uh, that, uh, that indeed the authors mentioned in the paper <clears throat> related to this uh, challenge uh, is the no recording, potential no recording of no purchases. Um, uh, but even if there is, say, in the case of the airlines, the, the carriers uh, record the no purchases. There is still some sensor demand when a large fraction of sales occur via third uh, parties like uh, OTAs uh, or, um, or third party websites. Uh, <clears throat> such a it would be great to know from your experience um, how, how big is this fraction 
you mentioned big fraction in the in the paper, but but you don't disclose disclose the numbers. So it would be great to know that number. Um, and the focus of this paper is indeed about learning price demand relationship given historical observations. Um, now the demand model uh, that they present is indeed uh, summarizing these uh, two equations in the paper. I think uh, Ravi also put these two equations in his presentation. Um, so um, the main goal of this um, of these equations is indeed to estimate the theta parameter, which is accounting for the price sensitivity. Um, and then the other elements of this equation are the uh, observed purchases y, the vector of exogenous features x. Uh, there is this vector w. Uh, the authors mentioned that this is a subvector of x, and but it's, it's, it's not clear how to pick that subvector of, of x uh, from from the from the paper at least. Um, and then there are two functions that need to be uh, so function phi that needs to be uh, to some extent estimated from their uh, machine learning approach. And then there is this function G that maps uh, pretty much features on prices. Um, and again, as I said, the main goal is to estimate the price sensitivity parameter theta. So the demand estimation that uh, first described in the paper is a naive approach where they fit a supervised model with desired features. Um, and demand a response variable. And then they also highlight the shortcomings of this uh, naive approach, uh, including the choice. So first of all, I mean, this naive approach enforces some structural baseline model, uh, the presence of confounders that, as uh, Ravi clearly mentioned, you have to be careful on how to handle them. Uh, and then also the fact that uh, if you just uh, resort to, I would say, traditional uh, approaches, then you have the limitation that the model uh, indeed just, I mean, was just trained based on a range uh, of prices, and then it's, it's hard to extrapolate uh, observations out of this range uh, that, that was used for, for training. And then the, the proposal that they come up with is to build this uh, demand response model based on a hybrid framework with two main components, this observational baseline prediction of both price and demand, and at the same time, some parametric approach to estimate the causal relationship between deviation of price and demand from this baseline. Uh, so the main contributions uh, was basically, <clears throat> one is the, the, the Poisson semi-parametric demand response model with feature-dependent price sensitivity. Uh, Ravi proposed uh, or presented these two approaches, the direct approach, single stage, uh, via deep neural networks, and then the robust two-stage approach uh, based on a stage one using machine learning to build a predictive model for price and demand conditional on other features, and then a second stage where they come up with this interpretable parametric model in order to infer this uh, parameter uh, theta. And then in the, in, the, in the paper, there is a chapter that I think that in the interest of time probably didn't uh, didn't uh, go over, um, which is this price optimization. So there is a full section on, on price optimization. Um, so uh, now let me highlight some of the, of the things that I think uh, will be indeed uh, important for the contribution of this paper uh, to, the, to the revenue management and pricing community. Um, one is the use of machine learning in the context of airline demand estimation and price optimization. This is kind of a, a novel approach. And even though there is some sort of a, also some incipient uh, research related to the use of machine learning in operations in general and in revenue management in particular, I think that having the, the endorsement of you know, practitioners uh, disclosing the fact that indeed they are using this in order to improve the system, this is a good uh, a good source to have as as a motivation to uh, seek uh, other alternative machine learning uh, approaches in the case of estimation of demand and and price optimization. Um, so one thing that they pointed out in the in the paper is that I mean one of the of the recent topics that was kind of. Uh, on the spot was the use of randomized pricing experiments. They highlighted, at least in the context of airlines, this is not uh, feasible. 
Um, and then also another, another thing that I actually confirmed from the AWS papers is the fact that some of the classical revenue management and pricing problems remain interesting for, for practical applications. And in particular, uh, they list three uh, throughout the paper. One, of course, is the estimation of future dependent price sensitivity and demand. The other one is the challenge of demand and censoring. So there were several proposals along, along this, I mean, in order to tackle this problem, but this seems to be still uh, a big challenge in, in, the, in the airline industry. And then also the use of peak prices. Uh, this seems to be still in place to determine the availability of fair classes at the origin destination level. So even though the, the development of techniques in order to infer, say, accurate bid prices is a pretty mature uh, area within revenue management, and it's one of the classic topics in revenue management, still seems to be indeed uh, in, in place. And therefore, it's also good to know that uh, the airlines are, are using them. And, and then I think this reference could, I mean, this paper could be a good reference to, to kind of motivate further research along these lines. Um, and then a key current challenge is uh, the seek to implement robust framework for automatic dynamic pricing. So this is related to the section on dynamic pricing that uh, is included in the paper, but, but Ravi uh, didn't include in his, in his presentation. And, uh, and then just a, a couple of suggestions for the, for the authors, uh, and please take, it, uh, take them very gently. Um, so in my experience, at least, uh, uh, I mean, the exposition in the, on, of, the, of the sections on the two-stage estimation approach and the price optimization was a bit hard to follow, at least for me. Uh, so I think uh, probably that could be, to some extent, uh, I don't know, to some extent twisted in a, in a, in a way that could be uh, easier to, to kind of uh, to follow. Um, then, is, I mean, even though you benchmark the two methods that you propose, single stage versus the two stage, I think it would be, it would be great to know how this, say, two stage, which seems to be the best performer, uh, compared with the current practice uh, for uh, demand estimation. So I'm sure you have some uh, current practice uh, for, I mean, starting from data, uh, including bookings, features, and prices. So there should be some state of the art that you use internally. And at least it would be good to know in simulated data, say, how your new proposal compared with your current practice. Um, so the other question I have is, even though you discuss the importance of sensor demand at the in introduction of your paper, it's not clear how your method accounts for this sensor demand. Uh, and also choice behavior. So uh, you have this function G that to some extent maps features into prices. Uh, I guess this function G could be accounting for the solution of the network revenue management problem. Maybe that, uh, I mean, one way to account for choice behavior is by accounting or, or subsuming it within the calculation of the bid prices. But I mean, it's, it's not clear uh, how to account for that uh, in the context of your two-stage machine learning-based uh, estimation approach. So I think, I mean, probably, I mean, I have a, a few questions here. So maybe Ravi can take over in the remaining two, two minutes and maybe uh, address some of them. Yeah, yes. thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Gustavo. Yeah, it, it was a really uh, great summary and, and uh, insights regarding the paper. Uh, certainly, there are uh, these sections we can work on improving. Uh, to, to address some of your questions, uh, uh, does the proposal account for uh, censored demand? Uh, and by censored, I mean, what we use is just uh, bookings, right? So bookings are uh, bookings, prices, and uh, context feature vectors. But I, I think we, what you are concerned about is, let's say, uh, stock out happened on a flight uh, in between, and uh, you 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 don't have further observations and and how to account for that. So so currently we we uh, we have we haven't addressed that particular part yet. So uh, that's that's something that we can we can look look deeper into. Uh, and on the choice behavior, uh, so this this function g actually is is again uh, you know kind of 
uh, it's a deep neural net of, that we use to estimate the first stage model. And in fact, we uh, we use the uh, many OD data together to train these neural networks in the first stage. So some of these aspects uh, could uh, be indirectly, uh, you know, um, learned through the, these deep neural networks, but uh, yeah, only basically the dependence uh, based on the historical information that you saw, right? Because it's just training that neural network. So, uh, so we do. Uh, so, I, I think the network aspects can come into uh, play in in construction of, uh, of of these functions G because we are training a lot of uh, origin destinations together. Uh, so, so that's that's one uh, particular way. Uh, um, I, I must say that like these systems that we are constructing are working over the network optimization problem. So once you estimate the price sensitivity, uh, the, the, the opportunity cost or the bid price calculation is still, still a network, network optimization problem. So you compute, you solve your RM system solves that problem, gives you a, a bid price, which you, you, which the models consume as cost and then find the price uh, on, on these refined set of features, right? So, so in that sense, uh, the, 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 the pricing considers the network effects because it is working on top of an RM system. Uh, so that's... Uh... Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ravi. So um, I think we are uh, right on time maybe to move to our next... Um, our next talk. So thank you both, Ravi and Gustavo, for uh, for a very nice paper and discussion. Uh, and again, after the session, uh, there's time and a space maybe in the virtual room to continue the discussion. Um, all right. So let's move now to our second paper, um, and is uh, Sikunye. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Who is going to be talking about efficient algorithms for maximizing composition of convex functions? So um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rene. Thank you for the introducing. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my session. My name is Quinn. I'm a PhD student from the University of Illinois. So in the next half hour, I'm very happy to share my recent work on algorithms, and specifically uh, for a class of the optimization problems. Uh, so where the objective function is a composition of convex and random functions. And I will also apply our algorithm in the network revenue management. And this is joint work with Professor Xinchen, Professor Niao He, and Yifan. So here is the outline of my talk. I will first formally define the optimization problem we are solving and give the concrete example from the network revenue. And later I will introduce our proposed algorithms for the, uh, as long as the, uh, also, also the theoretical guarantee. And I will also show the numerical results of our proposed algorithms uh, in the network revenue management. So by the way, if you have any question during the talk, uh, feel free to ask in the chat box. I can address those questions in the end. But during the talk, my co-author Yifan is also here. Uh, he can help with uh, some of those questions. So first, let me formally define the uh, optimization problem we want to solve. So here we want to minimize f function over the decision variable x. So here the objective function is the expected value over the composition of convex function f and random function phi. So here we assume uh, the box constraint, and we assume that both decision vector x and random vector cos psi has the same dimension d. And this function phi is defined component-wisely and non-decreasing x. So uh, let me give a more concrete example of this problem one, and we call it uh, stochastic optimization under the random truncation. So in this special case, here the phi function is defined as the x wedge cos psi. So here the notation wedge is the component-wise minimum of the decision variable uh, x and random vector cos psi. So actually, as uh, throughout my presentation, I will always stick to this special case, only for the simplicity and for better illustration. So let me talk about why we are interested in this special class of the stochastic optimization problems. So here is the motivation example from the quantity-based network revenue management. So it basically asks, when a request from a specific demand class comes in, uh, should the airline accept or not? 
So let's look at this special instance uh, in this left-hand figure. And here, this airline network has a spoke hub structure uh, with the center node five and n equals to four different spokes. So here, there are total two times n different flights in this network represented by links. And each flight has a limited capacity. So under this network structure, there are total n times n plus one different origin destination pairs. And if we consider two different fail classes for each OD pair, uh, we, there would be total true n times n plus one different demand classes. And we know there are many different control policies for this type of problem, uh, like bid price control from the deterministic linear program or more sophisticated dynamic programming. Um, but in this talk, um, we are focused on the booking limit control uh, for this type of problem. So which can be formulated as the special case of the optimization problem I mentioned earlier. So typically we can separate the whole problem into two stages. So first reservation stage and then followed by the service stage. So at this uh, reservation stage, our decision is the booking limit X for each demand class. And when a new request of class I comes in, uh, we will accept the reservation if current accepted demand is less than its XI. So by introducing this notation uh, Xi, which represents the total demand over the whole reservation stage, then we can use this X watch Xi to represent the total accepted reservations during the first stage. Then at the second survey stage, we will serve the demand with limited capacity. Here, we also assume this capacity is random and is realized at the beginning of this service stage. So due to this random capacity, the overbooking is unavoidable. So in this stage, we have to decide how many passengers can get on a plan to be served. And we can model this network revenue problem under the booking limit control as the two-stage stochastic program showing this model two. So in this objective function, the first turn is the revenue by accepting up to X watch Kasai reservations. And the second turn represents the expected penalty incurred by rejecting passengers. And most specifically, uh, this function tau uh, is the optimal objective value of this linear model for the capacity allocation at the service stage. So in this linear model, we decide how many passengers W can get on the plan. And the objective is to minimize the penalty of rejecting passengers subject to first the capacity constraint. And we also to have to make sure that the on onboarding passenger has to be larger than zero and smaller than the number of the reservations in the first stage. So it is well established result that this F function is concave. And as we can see that this problem uh, with booking limit control can be formulated as a special case of this uh, stochastic optimization problem we mentioned earlier. And meanwhile, uh, not limited to this problem, many problems in the supply chain management can also be formulated in this way. So in this case, the decision variable X is the ordering quantity, which is truncated by this random capacities. And the major challenge of this type of problem is that the objective function is non-convex, even if this F function is convex. So here I'm, uh, I'm given two small examples to illustrate this non-convexity. The first one is the quadratic function F x squared with the random uh, variable psi follows the normal distribution. Here we can clearly see that this objective function is no longer convex. And for the two-dimensional case, it is not even cost convex. So the main research question we are trying to answer is how to find the absolute global optimal solution of this stochastic non-convex problem efficiently, given only the samples of Kasai. So later I will explain what we mean by the samples of Kasai. So before introducing the proposed algorithm and uh, uh, our theoretical results, I want to talk about the very important structure. Uh, we call this hidden convexity of this problem. So roughly, we can do the variable change to get the equivalent of formulation. So here, we use the notation G to denote this variable change from decision variable X to U, so which is defined as the expectation over X watch cosine. So in the network revenue application I mentioned earlier, this uh, simply means changing from the original decision variable 
booking limit X to the average number of accepted reservations. So here we use the notation G inverse as simply as the inverse of the G function. And given this reformulation on the right-hand side, a very interesting result proved by Fong and Shashikuma in 2018 states that as long as this random vector the sign uh, is component-wisely independent and f function is convex, then the transformed objective function G is convex in decision variable U. So this result gives us the motivation to design an efficient algorithm with the global convergence guarantee. So now let me talk about algorithm design. So given this convex reformulation, the most straightforward algorithms one can think of is the gradient-based methods. So however, uh, I want to mention that these projected gradient methods are not directly implementable on this transformed problem because we don't know the full distribution of the random vector side. And more specifically, uh, we can see that first, we cannot compute this function G exactly because this calculation involves the distribution of the side. Uh, second, uh, we cannot perform the projection because its calculation also involves this G function. Uh, it is unknown because we have to access this uh, side distribution only through samples. And similarly, we cannot calculate this unbiased estimator, uh, gradient estimator for a similar reason. And to overcome this issue, we can use the empirical distribution of Kasai instead uh, through the samples and to approximate this function. So more specifically, we can first do the sample average approximation first for the original objective function. Then we can apply this SAA on the variable change. Then we can put in these two together. We can get the convex reformulation of this SAA. Now we can solve the problem using any standard algorithm for the convex uh, optimization, specifically for this reformulation. Uh, let's say the standard projected SGD algorithm. So however, as I mentioned, um, uh, there are actually several drawbacks of this, uh, this type of method. So first, it has to do the variable change at each iteration uh, because we have to compute the gradient based on the X value. But if we implement in the use space, U decision space, we have to do the variable change to get the uh, corresponding X value. And second, it requires a large batch of samples to approximate this G function. Third, uh, if we use a naive estimator of this G function, uh, we will get large uh, variance of this gradient estimator shown in our paper. And it motivates us to design more efficient algorithms to get rid of this SAA. And this figure shows a high level idea of how our proposed algorithm can work. Uh, so our algorithm directly updates in the original decision space uh, X, and it only used the hidden convexity uh, in analysis through the corresponding transformed variable U. And we also want to achieve the sample efficiency and get rid of the uh, SAA. So here is the high level picture of our algorithm. And later I will talk about the details of that. And now let me go through the landscape of this optimization problem, which gives the idea why our gradient method can uh, only in the original decision space, but can find a global optimal solution. So let's look at the simplest case without any constraint. We can show that under some mild assumptions, any stationary point X of original objective function F is also global optimal as long as this gradient GX is positive definite. The proof is actually very straightforward using the hidden convexity. So as uh, let's see these details, uh, for the truncation case, this gradient GX equals to one minus HX. So here the HX is CDF of the random variable psi. So this gradient G is larger than zero if and only if this X is smaller than the essential supreme of psi. So here, we by, by the chain rule, we can get the gradient of the G original uh, transform decision uh, objective function. Gradient of GU equals to the gradient of GX inverse transpose times the gradient of FX. So it means that we only need to find a good stationary point of F. So in this case, this X is smaller than the essential supreme of the psi. Then this gradient G is equal to zero because the first term is finite and the second term is zero. 
And then using the hidden convexity, we know this point is also called global optimal. So here, this figure on the right uh, shows that, uh, shows the toy example with quadratic x. And in this example, when x is large, uh, there are actually some bad local stationary points, which is non-optimal. Uh, this simply because this x is larger than the essential supreme of Kastai. So those are bad local stationary points we want to avoid in the algorithm. So now let's move to the, our algorithm. We call this mirror grid, gradient descent, MSG. So what does this mirror mean in our algorithm? Let me explain the uh, very high level idea of this MSG. Uh, as I mentioned, it is uh, in the transformed objective function G, uh, it is convex. And we know that SGD in this G function converge globally with the optimal convergence rate. So it drives us to design this MSG algorithm to update the original decision variable X, uh, but we want this updating rule can mirror the updates in the U decision space. So let's look at the detail of the updates by the gradient method. So here, the first line of equations is roughly the updating of gradient descent in the U decision space. So here, UT plus one minus UT equals to the negative step size gamma times the gradient of G. And then we can, uh, we want this updating rule in the X decision space, which is GXT plus one minus GXT, uh, mirror the updates in the U decision space. Then we can use the Taylor uh, expansion, first order Taylor expansion. Uh, we can approximate it uh, using the gradient G times the XT plus one minus XT. So combine these three equations and move XT plus one to the left-hand side, we can get this updating rule. XT plus one equals XT minus the uh, step size times the gradient G inverse transpose times the gradient of the transform objective function GU. So then the by chain rule, we can get the second equation without any transform decision variable U in the formula. Yes, there are only X in this formula. So the remaining quick question is how to estimate this uh, matrix inverse using the samples of the cosine. So here I will only briefly talk about intuition and the property of estimator for this G inverse. So the construction basically follows Newman series expansion for the symmetric random matrix. And to translate this series into the estimator, we use the random sampling and important sampling. And by doing this, uh, our constructed estimator MXK can approximate gradient G inverse with exponentially small error and bound to the second moment. So here the sampling cost is also very mild. And in another word, to ensure the small bias epsilon, the sampling cost is in the order of uh, log one over epsilon. And given this estimator, uh, our MSG algorithm is quite straightforward. So at each iteration, we will construct two independent estimator, M1 and M2, for this gradient G inverse. And then we apply the train rule to get the unbiased stochastic gradient estimator for this gradient of fx. And another important feature uh, of our MSG is that it incorporates the uh, regularizer term lambda. So it, this lambda essentially helps to avoid the bad local stationary points we I mentioned earlier. And if we assume this xt is larger than this essential supreme of psi, it means that this gradient f is always equal to zero and the algorithm will stuck in the local stationary point. And this regularizer can shrink the value of x and help to avoid those bad stationary points. And one of our contributions from the algorithm side is listed in this myth theorem. And we can prove that under some regular assumptions, so mainly some smoothness and continuity assumption of the of functions, our MSG algorithm can find an absolute global optimal solution of the original non-convex problem with sample and gradient complexity in the order of epsilon to the power of negative two. So here the sample complexity means the number of sample psi used by the algorithm. And the gradient complexity is roughly how many times we have to compute the gradients. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first non-asymptotic global conversion guarantee for this type of problem. And we know that for general non-convex problem, the, op the optimal gradient complexity to find stationary point is epsilon to the power of negative four. 
So however, our MSG can leverage this hidden convexity to achieve the near optimal gradient complexity. So let me elaborate more on this uh, near optimality and the lower bound of our algorithm. So specifically, a uh, Gower in uh, 2009 construct uh, uh, a class. So they consider a class of the stochastic first order black box algorithms for the Lipschitz convex function. And they construct this hard instance array uh, in the proof for this class of the problem. And the lower bounds they prove uh, on the gradient complexity is in the order of uh, epsilon to negative two. And interestingly, this hard instance is actually a special case of our optimization problem with the random function phi equals to x uh, plus cosine. So here, this hard instance falls into the interac inter interaction between the Lipschitz convex function of our problem. And essentially, uh, our MSG algorithm are most, uh, are most match the lower bound for solving a class of the stochastic uh, convex problem. So in the remaining part, I will use the, our algorithm to solve the uh, network revenue problem under broken limit control and present the numerical results. So in the experiment setting, uh, we use the testing example from the open data set and all test instances are based on this spoke hub structure. And we use uh, different parameter levels, uh, including the number of spokes, uh, price ratio between high low field classes and show up probability, and also the different pen penalty. And we also consider different load factor and the various level of the random capacity. So uh, by using different levels of these uh, parameters, we construct 98, uh, 96 different uh, test instances for our numerical study. So uh, let me first touch upon the computational cost in this uh, problem. We consider two classes of the control policies. Uh, first is our booking limit control policy, and then another is the bid price control. So for the booking limit control policy, we use our algorithm MSG uh, and also the SAA plus SG algorithm to solve. And for the bid price control policies, we run several benchmarks, including the DLP, VCBP, and DPD. So here the DLP is called the deterministic linear program, which is widely used in practice. And this DLP uh, method basically replaces the random demand and capacity with its mean value, and only, only requires to solve the LP once to get the control policy. And we also compare our method to the state of our control policy called the BCBP, virtual capacity and bid price. So compared to the uh, classical bid price control, this BCBP is also uh, take the virtual capacity as a decision variable. So the pro of, the, pro of this uh, method is that it, it is uh, better in dealing with the random capacity. So however, uh, the, the author also proposed a gradient descent method to solve this problem, but only with the stationary guarantee. So we propose, uh, they also, uh, they also, so for the DPD method, it roughly decomposed the dynamic program into multiple single leg models to handle the curse of dimensionality. So those uh, three benchmarks we are trying to compare in the following. And we can see that uh, over all test instances, we observe that our MSG algorithm performed very fast with only eight seconds when n equals to four and 32 seconds when n equals to eight. And this table reports the average increase in the revenue of the booking limit control policy compared to other control policies. So average over all instances, uh, we observe that our booking control uh, policy gains higher revenue than other methods significantly. And we also observe that the booking limit control performs much better when the variance is large, similar to the VCBB. Uh, but unlike VCBP, as I mentioned, uh, our convergence, our algorithm guaranteeing the global convergence also uh, uh, it is very robust to different initialization and different sample paths. But here I want to highlight that uh, under the deterministic competitive case, there are several instances um, that book and limit control policy perform worse uh, than the DPD and the VCDBP. But over all instances, there's no significant difference. We, so we also look at the more complicated, more complicated case in the air cargo setting. So there are three major differences in, uh, to the passenger case. First, the capacity of the air cargo 
has two dimensions, weight and volume. Second, the capacity consumption is also random. Third, the routing is flexible, which means that the customer only specify the origin and destination, but not care about the route they actually be assigned. And the decision maker has to make the routing decision on the service stage. And this figure on the right demonstrate this routing flexibility. So one can take the flight night to ship the cargo from origin one to destination three. And on the other hand, uh, she can also take the two consecutive flights, one and seven, and go through transition point five. And similarly, we test the algorithm on the open data set with different parameter levels, including the variance of demand, variance of capacity, and load factor. And we compare our algorithm to the state-of-art air cargo DPD method, uh, specifically for this air cargo setting. And due to this complexity of the routing decision, this uh, AC DPD method only deals with a routing decision in a very heuristic way. And then we observe that our booking limit control policy significantly improved the performance by 13% under the fixed route setting and 17% under the routing flexibility setting. Uh, five minutes left. Um, okay, great. I'm about to finish this presentation, but thank you for a reminder. So as a quick summary, in our work, we designed the efficient algorithm to solve a special class of the stochastic non-convex optimization problem, and we can have the global guarantee. And our proposed algorithm only performs updates in the original decision space, and the complexity bound of this MSG matches the lower bound for stochastic in the convex problem. And from the application side, we apply our method, our algorithm to the passenger network value management with booking limit control, as well as air cargo setting. So we show that booking limit control policy has super real numerical performance under the high capacity variance setting. Yeah, I think that's all I want to share today. Thank you. Uh, if you are interested in the details of the talk, you can check the uh, check our paper uh, in the SSR webpage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sikun. Um, let's see if there's any question. We have a few minutes um, in case there's any question at this point. All right, I don't see questions. Um, all right, in that case, maybe we uh, move into um, Ling Wei, who's going to discuss the paper. Oh, oops. Oh, sorry, all right. Uh, uh, can you guys see my slides? Yeah, all right, great. All right, thank you. All right, thanks so much for, for having me. Uh, so thank you to Quan for a great presentation. So it's my great pleasure to discuss this paper. So the way I will run the discussion is the following way. I will briefly go over the paper again and then highlight the main steps and the key ideas behind the paper. Okay, so this paper is about stochastic optimization under random truncation. Why the problem is so important? So there are two classical applications. One is about supply chain management. So in this case, your decision variable is X, like how many odd, uh, quantities you want to order. And could C is your supplier's random capacity. And- Sorry, Sterling, wait, uh, the slide seems frozen. All right, how about now? Great, great now. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. All right, sorry. Um, okay, now there are two important applications. Uh, one is on supply uh, inventory management. Now, in this case, the decision is to order quantity X and truncated by the supplier's random capacity. Um, so the other example is as a uh, sequent measure in random management. In that case, the decision variable is your booking limits and could C is a random demand. Why the problem is so difficult? Because the function is not convex in general, uh, even if the function f is convex. To briefly illustrate that, right, right, just imagine, suppose your C has an upper limit. When your decision variable x is go beyond this limit, and eventually 
your value would be somehow a, a constant. So that uh, uh, tells you that the function is not convex in general. Okay, now we have an important family of uh, problem, but unfortunately we don't have convexity. Then what do you do about it? So the story comes from the paper by Fong and Shantikuma in 2018. So they show that even though the original problem is not convex, however, if I do a transformation, now I do have convexity. So the transformation is run in following way. I'm going to translate my variable x to u. u is the expected uh, uh, value of the truncation. So in the inventory setting, right, right think about your variable is your other quantity. And after the transformation, u is tell you what you expect it yields, okay? So basically you translate your quantity to the expected yields. After you do this transformation and surprisingly, now you have convexity in U. So that's the main result by the paper from Anshini Kumar. I want to highlight a key assumption behind this result. So this theorem requires that um, KC is component-wise independent. So I want to emphasize this very important uh, assumption that so without um, independence, so it's unclear the results will still hold. Okay, that everything else is building on this assumption. Um, and, and, and furthermore, in that paper, they also mention other uh, functions and other examples. So uh, specifically, they have four examples in that paper. So random capacity is one of them. So the other one is random yields. Like your decision is X and C is the percentage of your yields. So X times C is also belongs to this family. There are two other examples. So in general, they have a theorem says that if your function is to cast linear in middle points, and then you can guarantee this convex transformation. All right, now uh, that everything uh, about this paper is building on this assumption. Okay, now the main, uh, the main um, question the paper tried to address is to how do we utilize these results to efficiently compute X or U? Okay, now uh, a, um, a simple uh, idea is that can we try naive stochastic gradient descent method, right? Because I, we know the function is convex in U, can we simply apply state of art gradient descent methods? The answer is no, unfortunately, due to the following reasons. So one of the reasons is that now you have this inverse function of G, uh, G and so it's unclear you can estimate this inverse function efficiently. The other reasons include that now the, you translate from X to U and the domain of the space U is somehow unknown, all right? So, there are, uh, so in summary, even though we know the function is convex in U, um, unfortunately, the naive version of stochastic gradient method may not directly work. Okay, now the key idea of the paper. Uh, so in my, in my view, this is the punchline of the paper. So, now, since we, uh, we cannot apply gradient descent for the transformation space, why not we simply apply the gradient descent method in the original space? All right, so I'm going to design algorithm for my original variable X. Although I know the function is not convex in X, but I know this collection between X and U, I also know U, I also know the function is convex in U. And then after applying you know, this collection, I'm going to prove that once I use so kind of gradient descent method, I can guarantee global convergence. So that's the main idea of the paper. So to me, this is a beautiful idea. Okay, now one algorithm they designed the paper, so which I don't think uh, Sequin discussed in the talk. So, uh, so the first algorithm is that why not I simply add a regularization term lambda, okay? So I'm going to use gradient descent method to, to the original space X. I'm going to add this regularization term lambda. So the reason to add um, this term lambda is because the, orig the original function is not convex in X. After I add this term, now I have convexity. Okay, now I can guarantee global convergence. So, um, so the algorithm performs well in simulation. Unfortunately, from a theoretical perspective, the worst case bound does not match the lower bound. 
So it's well known that um, in for first order gradient descent method, so the lower bound is one over epsilon square. But unfortunately, if you um, simply apply this regularized gradient descent method, your bound is one, one over epsilon force, so which does not match the lower bound. So which mo motivates the authors to design the second algorithm that they have worst case bound that matches the lower bound. And, the, and so the second uh, algorithm is the middle uh, method. So the idea, just, uh, as mentioned by Quinn, so somehow you do uh, your update in the original space. So uh, uh, in a way that you can measure the updates in the reformulated space. So there are some subtleties in the algorithm, so which I will not go further. Uh, I know it's late afternoon. So, I'm, uh, so I do a quick summary. Okay, now after you, you, know, you uh, use this uh, middle descent method, you are going to match the lower bound. So you have one over epsilon square. Okay, so in summary, the major contribution from theoretical perspective, they are able to prove that for the problem that is not convex in general, they can still uh, uh, design an efficient algorithm that guarantee global convergence that matches the lower bound. All right, finally, the simulation part. So there are two components from for the simulation part. So the first part is test how efficient the conversion is. So specifically then compare their algorithm with the naive gradient descent method. So, uh, as you can tell that their algorithm can converge much faster than the naive version. So this is not surprising. The second part of the simulation, they compare their algorithm with the state-of-the-art algorithms. So this shows their performance really well. All right. So in summary, this paper studies a very important family of stochastic optimization problem with random truncation. The function is not convex, and they are able to build a nice collection between the original space to a reformulation space, and then they use the convexity to prove global convergence. All right. So uh, I have a few questions for the authors. As I mentioned earlier, one of the key assumptions in the paper uh, and the same assumption in the paper by Fong and Shanti Kumar is that they require independent random vector. So I wonder if you have dependent random vector, can you, can you extend the result uh, to the dependent case? So my second question is that uh, now your method is, uh, use the result from gradient descent. So this is a very nice, method for convex problem. My question is that um, if say you use different types of algorithm to, to attack this convex problem, can you still prove things, you know, somehow similar results? And my third question is about um, um, other applications. So I feel the, the methodology is so powerful that it can be in principle applied to other problems. So I wonder besides the classical inventory management and revenue management problem. So are there any other new applications? All right, so this concludes my, my discussion. Thank you uh, very much, Ningwei, and uh, also thank you to the speaker. So we have time, maybe the speaker or the co-authors can um, think about this question and provide some answers. Um, Yes. Okay. So I will be happy to answer some of the questions. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. So uh, I think it's a link. I think it's a, I think these are uh, definitely interesting questions. So um, for dependent random vector, I think so as you mentioned, right? So uh, that reformulation actually so may uh, may not be equivalent anymore. So uh, we do have another uh, actually. So I have another uh, reformulation. So for the uh, dependent uh, random vector uh, case, um, uh, but okay, was well, so the algorithm design uh, will be much more complicated because I, uh, I think that the another like so convex reformulation actually need to leave like the uh, function space to uh, to infinite dimensional. Uh, we think okay, potentially we can develop like this SGD for infinite dimensional. Uh, I think it's a formulation, but uh, uh, we uh, we don't know what the complexity bound uh, will be, so that's uh, something uh, we are thinking about. And uh, then, 
Oh, Shane, uh, so a follow-up question. So uh, so do you consider positive correlation or do you consider negative correlation? Uh, well, I think that's an important thing. Okay, well, we need like a positive correlation. If uh, I don't think we can get rid of like, this, this, this positive correlation assumption. Okay, and then uh, for those practical problems like in revenue management and inventory management, so do you expect you have like more independent case or do you expect it, it, it's more like the, uh, positively co correlated? So yeah, well, I, I think it's uh, like a business settings actually. So, right, so I think a positive correlated case will make will make sense, right? So think about you have like some, uh, I think it's a some uh, independent components and then with a common, I guess, uh, perturbation, right? So that uh, add together, so uh, to you independent components. So that will create like a so positive, um, uh, positive like a so correlation, right? But I cannot really say, okay, so uh, in practice, okay, well, uh, whether, whether, okay, so independent case or positive correlated case, okay, will be more common. But I think so you do have, like, so uh, I, I think in many business uh, cases, actually, so uh, this actually make, uh, makes sense, right? Okay, another, okay, when you say uh, other applications, right? So, uh, um, well, inventory management definitely. I think so. We can. Uh, we we haven't tried. I think. Uh, I think here. I think because we want to use like a network revenue management. Is it really because? Uh, I think it's a, another important message is a booking limit to control actually uh, outperforms right. So that the bid price control. Uh, when I think when we have like a running capacity. I think so. That's actually so different from like a, so uh, the deterministic. Um, uh, capacity and network revenue management setting. So I, w I feel like that actually is a very important uh, a message uh, to, uh, I, I think, so to deliver. Uh, other methods, so I think, uh, so uh, uh, well, here we really could try to write the first order uh, type of method, right? Uh, definitely, I think, so uh, maybe we can try like as a Newton method, uh, a quasi Newton method. So we haven't uh, really, okay, look at that yet. But I think that this is definitely so uh, interesting direction to go. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you, Shin. Um, all right, any other questions for um, the authors? All right, I don't see any questions. It has been a long day, I suppose. Um, I want to thank everyone, uh, the speakers and the discussants, for sure. Um, for their presentations. Uh, I think it was a great session and um, everybody's welcome to go to the main venue if you still have some energy and keep some discussion um, after the talk. Otherwise, I hope to see you all tomorrow for uh, day two. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.